be confident about being you. Don't try to hide behind this idea of a bigger company. Episode 150. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I'm speaking to the fabulous Sue Austin of Sue Austin Consulting and Juliet Mitchell of Archetypal, who have both been brilliant guests here on the show before. Sue has 30 years of senior and director level experience in large and small scale organizations, and for the last five years has worked exclusively with owners of architecture practices and design studios, helping to address the complex challenges of running a business. Juliet runs a writing consultancy for architects, helping architects find their voice and tell better stories by guiding them through the writing process and unlocking the power of words, not just for marketing, but also in articulating their vision. In this episode, we discuss the discovery process in developing your vision, the role of a strong story and narrative in the goal setting process, defining the culture and purpose of your business through values and some strategies and tactics that can help bring these values to life. So sit back, relax and enjoy Sue Austin and Juliet Mitchell. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Sue and Juliet, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. Welcome again. How are you both? Very well. Yep, glad to be back. Yeah, it's lovely to see you again, Ryan. We were just saying before the call how long it's been, how time is flying by so quickly. Yeah, absolutely. And I was very excited to hear that both of you are collaborating with each other. Um, So I think to, to begin the conversation, perhaps if... Um, Sue, we'll start with you and then Juliet will move to you. Um, if you could just kind of give us a little bit of a background on your, what it, who you are, what, what it is that you do, and then we can talk about how you guys have actually kind of come together. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Ryan. Um, yes, my name is Sue Austin. Um, I run my uh, consultancy practice called Sue Austin Consulting. Uh, for the last five years, I've been working almost exclusively with small architectural practices on providing general business support, whether it's on strategy development, operations diagnostics, leadership development, so pretty broad. So that's me and what I do And I run a writing consultancy for architects. Uh, It's called Archetypal with an I. And uh, it's, um, I've started in 2017. And I think that Sue and I first started working together. It was probably 2018, or at least that's Mm -hmm. when we were introduced to each other by a a mutual client. Um, And I think as time has gone on, we found we've uh, had more mutual clients and found that what we do actually complements uh, each other very well. Brilliant. No, because I, I thought it was really interesting. Obviously, you know, Sue, you, you've you've come from the a, a background of working in large in large corporates and, and and Mars, and you know, you've been working very heavily on that kind of uh, corporate strategic vision aspect of it. And obviously, Juliet, you're kind of you're really unlocking the power of words for architects to be able to use, and you know, not not just in their marketing and then their in their copy, but also as ways of articulating vision. Uh, and how powerful word can, words can be in that. So it was a very exciting crossover of, of both of what you do. Um, so can you give us an example of what is it that you're, that, that, that you're, you're doing with clients at the moment? Uh, well, I'll start by saying, um, for me, it, it, um, when I started at Archetypal, I was all about the words. I'd come from Penguin where I worked for quite a long time, uh, 11 years, and I was an editor there. And it was all about the words. And I felt like the world, you know, the world beyond publishing needed to kind of really use the impact of words and do uh, sort of unlock the power of them. And so I started working with architects, having realized that they could do with some help on the word side. And then um, it dawned on me pretty quickly that actually the words were just the tip of the iceberg. And actually underneath all that, there was everything that had to be articulated. And words and kind of, writing helps you un- helps you with those thought processes so my what I did 
very quickly became much more than just writing copy. It became help. It became about helping clients to start to articulate what they did and start to sort of delve deeper into the reasons for what they were doing, their purpose, their vision. And that actually obviously fitted very well with what Sue was doing, which is equally about vision, about purpose and about, you know, what lies under the day to day of the business. So when we talk about vision in a business, is there a specific framework that you both use to help uh, a company articulate this and and if so what are the kind of component parts to it yes yeah, it's, it's a good question in actual fact when when julianette were julius and i were getting ready for this podcast we we realized of course and this is partly why we think we've got some complementary skills to bring to the table that we both approach it from a slightly different direction but actually they're both relevant so when i start working with a, a new client on their vision then for me, it's about, it starts with them as individuals, whether it's their, their sole owner or joint owners, the practice. And so it's about where do you want to be in the future? What's really fundamentally important to you? What do you want to be doing? What sort of clients do you want to be working with? What is your why? And Juliet's particularly good at drawing out the why, but you know, why are you doing this? And making sure that it's personal to the owners mm. rather than something they feel they should be doing. So it's really, it's, I'm not worried about, at my stage, I'm not worried about the words being perfect. What I want them to be able to do is to articulate where they want to be in the longer term. And, 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 it's a, and a phrase I use all the time is begin with the end in mind. If you don't know where you're heading, then you're going to end, end up somewhere by accident. So that's my kind of angle. But Juliet approaches it from a different direction. Juliet, over to you. Uh, well, it's it's um, in a way it's the same in that I absolutely agree that if you don't know who you are, you can't start to talk about how you can help other people. So it does start with you. So I'm absolutely with Sue on that. Um, I've got another. Uh, so I take it further because in the end, for me, it's about how to communicate that. So once you've worked out your why, once and I've got yeah various questions and ways that I can start to help clients uh, dig down uh, but then it's about turn it sort of flipping that story so it's about the client it's you know with that ideal client in mind um, I, um, Sue obviously talks a lot about the you know where you're going with the business which is really important I also kind of go backwards and I, I love it when clients can start to bring back that inspiration and that idealism that they might have had mm that day they decided to study architecture, the day they sat down at their kitchen table starting a new practice, um, because that obviously gets lost in the day-to-day of running a business. So, uh, so it's lovely to sort of take people out of that. And one of the great things about you know, running workshops with clients, and I imagine, Sue, that this is the same for you, is that you know, most of the time when you're running a business, and I feel the same about my business, it is about the day to day. It's about keeping it running. It's about, uh, you know, keeping the money coming in, but just keeping everything going and moving along. But a workshop, I think, whether it's a sort of business coaching session or a, um, a session with me, is a, a chance to step back and to mm. sort of rise above the day to day and let yourself think about those things. And that's actually that's really exciting for clients to be given permission to step back and to think about it and to um, be able to talk about it. And often clients find that, God, it's been years since they've actually had a chance to express that that idealism of all those years ago. I think I think the, the difficulty of trying to do it on your own and of course people can do it on their own um, is you can be too close to it. So part of our role as external support is to ask those probing questions, um, challenge whether that's really what they mean, either in the words or the kind of what they're aiming for, and say, well, do you mean this or do you mean that? So for me, that con- is, you go back to your question about framework. Of course, there's a kind of process we go through, right. but the really important thing is having that conversation and almost trying to get inside their head and pull out what's there. It's often a kind of jumble of thoughts that's rattling around the, their head. Some clients of ours are very clear. Yes. And what they just want to do is they want to just move it to the next level so that it's then something they can use externally. So there's a lot of clarity already there. Some are like, I've no idea. Some are actually at the start of the journey where the future is very uncertain. Mm-hmm. So actually to try and develop, for example, a full-blown business plan at that stage probably isn't a particularly isn't really necessarily valuable because you probably need to get your feet wet. 
go out and do some projects and find out what you really like doing when now you're running your own practice yep. rather than create this kind of 10 page business plan that will be out of date or irrelevant because you've had some change of fortune in the first year or two of business. So we're very, you know, one of the things that Juliet and I are really principled about in our approach with working clients, it's very much client driven. Yes, we've got some ways of working, but it depends where they are in their journey, it depends how clear and confident they are. And our role is to kind of nurture and accelerate that by bringing in that outside perspective. And uh, Sue, what you said about getting your feet wet, I think that's absolutely right. And that happens a lot with architects that, you know, they don't start with a really clear idea of what they're going to right. their business, their practice is going to be, because they probably started in the evenings after their day job, you know, maybe entering a competition, winning it, getting that first project, or just doing their, the bloke down the roads uh, extension, you know, it can, it can grow organically. But then at some point, they get to a point where they, well, either they're lo- leaving their day job, so suddenly it's all on the business, or they just realise they want more, that doing extensions isn't what they want to do. It might be absolutely what they want to do, in which case, great, focus on that. If it's not what they want to do, it that's the moment to sort of sit down and really think about it. And, yeah. you know, especially if it's just one person, a sole practitioner, then getting, uh, uh, you know, someone like me or Sue or both on board, uh, or, you know, use your partner, use a colleague, whatever, but start to talk about it, start to sort of externalise those thoughts. Um, and, and I was thinking of a, a kind of analogy for this why have a vision. Um, and uh, there's, a kind of, there's a principle you may or may not have heard of called that all things are created twice. Um, and the first, the first creation is the mental thought process, right. working out what ideas, etc. And the second one is the kind of physical or reality part. Um, and if you, if you, I think trying to think about an analogy that really works for architects. Think about building a house. It starts with the concept design, with ideas and aspirations. Um, and if they, if that brief and that concept design isn't clear enough, then you can end up the client can end up with the house isn't right. So for me, that creating twice. If you think vision and strategy is about that mental process of articulating the design and concept and aspirations. And then the second creation point is the end is the end point, or at least a point further in the future where you've actually delivered something, which is some measure of success against that original uh, creation. Do you understand my point? So the absence of a vision or strategy means you could end up with a house that is exactly what you didn't want. Yeah. And that works very well thinking about writing because, you know, writing is not something you can just sit down and do. If you do, you're going to sound wooden. You're not going to sound like yourself. You're not going to have all that thought that can make it about, you know, really personal to you. So it is about all of that as that first creation is the thinking that un unleashing the thought processes and then you'll be ready to write but you can't just sit down and write you can't just sit down one day and say and think right it's time to write my my practice profile you know if you do that then you're going to start with founded in 2010 we are an award-winning da, 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 which is going to sound like every other practice yes <laughs> basically to get it to make it specific and warm and personal to you and make it flow you've got to do that thinking first it's really interesting because when I speak to lots of corporate businesses or particularly or other consultants um, and other, other entrepreneurs outside of the architecture, the importance of vision is always critical. Company values, vision, purpose, a mission, all these sorts of things are, are kind of, you know, worked on and thought about and, and curated. And interesting when I've spoken to lots of architects, particularly leaders of well-known design firms, um, they'll often have a sort of suspicion around vision mm. and, and frameworks. Um, and, and I'm often curious about that because those people are often actually, they're, they're, they may say that they're not doing a vision, but they are. Uh, they often, they often in, they're embodying it, if you like. Um, or, or, there's a res- or something I've heard architects say before in the past that they've worried about having a vision or a clear plan or not a clear plan but a clear kind of mission if you like because of the worry of it excluding other organic opportunities that might come along have you ever come across that or or, or kind of yeah there's a there's a kind of but I think I guess the question is what drives that lack of confidence in 
why have one or what does it mean if I get it wrong? And, and, and in my experience, there's, there's a start, the start thing is there isn't a business context mm-hmm. that, that uh, owners have often, even if they worked in large practice, they may not, to your point, they may not have been felt like they were part of something that had some per- clear purpose. They were part of a, a big, a bigger machine, but didn't kind of have a business context or even a, a necessarily engagement within that business. Yep. Um, so they're starting from quite a low base and that, uh, of understanding the reason why you need a vision. Mm. And then there's, you're absolutely right, there's this, what happens if I set out my plan for the future and I get it horribly wrong? So there's fear of failure. Yep. There is fear of it becoming too rigid. Yes. But that's why, for me, it's about starting with something. You know, the worst thing for me about a business plan or a vision is, you kind of create it. It becomes this document that you should refer to and absolutely refer to. But then it becomes set as a, as it's kind of hanging around your neck like a millstone. What it should be is a point of reference that you go back to. Not not every week, but you know, in the rhythm of how you're running the business, stepping back and being strategic, and then maybe once a year reviewing it and say, does this still still hold true, or has something popped up that I never expected to happen that means actually now I can. I can amend it and, and set a new direction. So it's not about it being cast in stone. It's about having something as a point of reference. Back to that point of, are you going to get somewhere by design or default? Well, hopefully by design rather than by accident. But lucky accidents come along the way as well. That's the reality of life, isn't it? Yes. Well, I think it, it, it is absolutely that. And it gives confidence and it gives clarity. And it gives you that confidence to step off that beaten track. You know, if you think about it, it's, that's your path. But if you know that path, then you'll have the confidence to make little detours and, and you know, take a little scenic route because you know your final direction, you know where you're headed. Yes. Uh, while if you've really got nothing, um, you know, you're just going to be going with the wind, which is never a good thing. And I think, you know, that's why it's important for um, a practice to come up with that uh, that sort of mission statement, that manifesto for what they're doing so that they, you know, so that it can keep them on that path and it can, uh, you know, it guides them. I mean, Sue calls it the North Star, don't you? And it is that thing that it, you know, it if you have that, that far away sort of something that, that you're aiming towards, you're much more likely to be sort of building something worthwhile that is going to grow and grow. Uh, but I think it's, it's, it's well and good having a vision because that's, a kind, of, that's kind of the words that articulate your, your, your end point or where you'd love to be. But it does need some specifics below it. So for me, below visions are goals. Right. And it's really interesting when I have conversations with my clients about goals, when it comes to the personal goals, those are often not even thought about. So they might be the professional goals about the types of projects, types of clients, scale of projects, reputation, respected by peers, all that kind of stuff. But the, when it comes back to what's really important to the individual, often there's a hesitancy in expressing those. Mm. One really good example is what personal income do you want? And people say, well, and there's an embarrassment, which is strange, an embarrassment that some owners should even set a personal income goal. It's like, well, if you aren't going to make money and make sure that you get something out of that at a financial level, let alone professional level, then, you know, it, that won't become part of your, your planning. And you could end up paying yourself less than a part two if you're not careful in three years' time. So yeah. if you don't make that a goal, whatever that level is, then, again, you won't, you won't get there. Uh, and then the other personal goals around what does it mean for me in terms of my lifestyle? You know, again, often cli- clients are working 60, 70 hours a week. It's unsustainable. So, for example, when I started working with Carl Turner um, four or five years ago, one of his personal goals was to reduce the dependency on him from the day to day. That was fundamental to him. Yep. And it was, wasn't just about his life out of work because work was all consuming. It was about he wanted a different shape of the practice in terms of what his team did. And for me, that was a really pivotal point in his strategy or a p- pivotal requirement in his strategy that helped him move forward. And of course, it became pivotal to him becoming Turner Works rather than Carl Turner Architecture. Yes. This might be a good moment to say that uh, So Sue and I have chosen three of our shared clients to talk about with um, each of them has given their blessing for being talked about during the podcast so one of them is Carl Turner um, so Sue did you know did all that work with Carl because he was obviously 
uh, well, the whole, you know, it was Carl Turner architect, it was hanging on very much on him, uh, you know, it was his name above the door. Um, and, you know, all the work that Sue did with Carl then led to him being ready to turn into Turner Works. Mm. Um, and that's the point where I came on board and I was basically working with him and the team because the team was becoming more and more important and, you know, he wanted to empower them and make them part of, mm. part of that voice. Um, so, you know, I worked with them to give them that confidence to, uh, to tell their story, to find their own voice and to, um, you know, to, to build on their success. And they've done, well, they, you know, they do brilliantly. They do fantastic projects. So, so when, when working with a client like, like Carl, um, it, what was the kind of beginning steps that you worked through then in terms of creating this vision? Well, the begin the being it's back to it's back to having that conversation. So typically, the way I would start a, um, a business planning discussion is it's it's never done in one hit. First of all, because there's too much to kind of talk through. But typically, it starts with a uh, the owner the uh, doing some preparation. You know, where do you want to get to? What's your goal? So there's a bit of kind of prep, and then there's a there's a real working session, and it's back to that conversation. Yeah, so why do, why do you want to get there? Why is that important? Let's kind of flush that out, me playing it back to them, paraphrasing. And then I kind of feed that back and that becomes step one. And then step two or three, depending on how deep the business plan needs to be based on the situation, it's then, okay, if those are your vision, if that's your vision and goals, now let's talk about some objectives. So the goals are what you want to do, where you want to get to as a kind of articulating the aims of that vision. Then the objectives are, What's the sort of things at high level that need to happen? So, for example, if you wanted, if the goal was to grow um, from half a million turnover to three million turnover in the next five years, uh, and the goal was to uh, to um, only do scale projects of construction value a million pound up or whatever it might be, that might be a goal, and then an objective would be okay. How am I going to, you know, what are the, who are the, identifying the clients? So the need to identify the clients I want to work with. Right. Um, which sectors, etc. I mean, you know, there's always an overlap between goals and objectives. But you're starting to get a bit more granular. And then below that comes an action plan, which is, I always talk about, there's no use having a five-year action plan to be out of date from day one. But a 12-month action plan that helps you move forward on those goals and objectives. So in a way, the vision is still there, but it becomes less relevant when you start to get into the specifics, but it's always there as that North Star, as Julia said. But what, what makes a good goal? Uh, it should be measurable, ideally. Right. So there should be some measure of success. So if you can put a number against it, that's great. Not all things have a number, right? but some measure of success. Because it's interesting, when I talk to architects about goals or visions and they'll say things like we want to be you know the best known or we want to you know we want to design fantastic beautiful game-changing projects yeah and, that's and, and, I, and that for me that's just too generic so it needs to be specific so it might be okay uh we want to be specialists in community-led projects within the southeast of a certain scale yeah you want you know those ideal clients that are what you know so just having said that if a client who wants exactly that, you know, what is it's that kind of project, they're going to see that and think, you know, if, if that's part of the way that the practice talks about themselves, they're going to see that and think, ah, these are the people for me. These yeah. are the architects for me because they're going to recognize themselves in it because of the specifics. Um, so specifics are, you know, one of the five things that or, um, I have five adjectives that I talk about for good writing and obviously good I put in inverted commas because you can't really say what's good but you can start to give yourself a benchmark and you know specific being specific as opposed to generic is one being warm as opposed to cold being personal as opposed to impersonal being predictable as uh, sorry being unexpected as opposed to predictable and being fl natural as opposed to stilted so those are you know if you're struggling to write, use those adjectives uh, or, you know, have those in your mind as that's what I want to be. And the moment that you start to get more specific, you are going to make it more interesting. Right. You know, generic is, a, is there is something about um, a piece of writing that's generic, that's not, that's trying to appeal to everyone, that's not sort of 
what's the expression, pinning your hat or, uh, you know, hanging your hat on something. It's if you're not kind of going for the client or sort of making it clear who you're talking to, making eye contact with those ideal clients, uh, you will just write something that's trying to appeal to everybody, everybody and is making eye contact with no one. So that's really important. Yeah, and, and we don't use kind of corporate speak like USP, unique selling proposition, because actually the people think, so what, you know, I'm an architect in a, let's face it, a saturated marketplace. The mm-hmm. chance of me being able to do something completely niche, specialist, that nobody else is doing is unlikely. Yeah. But how do I differentiate myself by the way I communicate my value, my purpose? How do I make it resonate for me personally in an authentic way, which means I can talk with confidence externally? And how can I get back to your point about, you might go some down some other net, what's the core of what I want to do? Mm-hmm. What's at the heart of what I want to do? And the other stuff can kind of wrap around the edges. But it is, it is trying to not be unique, because that's unrealistic, but it is trying to get super clear what, about what's important to the practice owner uh, and their team. And, 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 so, and so what's the role of a strong story in this then? How does, how, does, how does developing a strong narrative emerge from this goal setting process, if you like? Uh, so once you've got your why, once you've worked out your purpose, you can then start to tell us, uh, tell a story from that. So the point of the why is that it's going to chime with your ideal client. So that's, you know, that's the start. Now, if we step back from, from that to what a story is, so stories, we're all hardwired basically to respond to stories. We've been responding to stories all our lives. They're a great way of, you know, kind of uh, engaging people. And a story has to have a beginning, a middle and an end. And, you know, that why, that inspiration behind what you do can be the start of that story. Um, Then um, talking about the value you bring to clients, so how you help clients, the challenges, the problems that they've got that you can overcome, you can help them with. That's the middle of the story and the impact the effect of what you do for them, how you change their lives, that's, that's the end of the story. So that brings you through sort of inspiration, challenge, impact. Um, and what's great about using that structure for a story, and that structure is end- endlessly versatile, you know, you can mm. tweak it, do whatever you want, but just remember you need a beginning, middle and an end. And what's great about it is that you will, you can easily flip it so that the client the ideal client or the you know if you're talking about a project for example that the client of that project is at the heart of the story so the story is not about you the right this is when it's for you know uh, for your website for someone else um for your ideal clients it's not about you the architect you are the facilitator but it's the client who is at the heart of the story they're the hero of the story and it's about how you help them how uh, the impact on them the effect on their lives and Basically, you want all those potential clients, those ideal potential clients to read those project stories. And I always call them project stories, not project descriptions, because I think that makes them immediately sound more interesting. Mm -hmm. But when they read those, they will, you hope, see themselves as part of that story. And that's what you want. And, you know, by engaging someone emotionally, that's when they can start to make decisions. Because a big decision like taking on an architect, that's not a tick box exercise it might be eventually but the first thing is it's an emotional decision that's how we make those big decisions you know we buy people we don't buy Mm. we buy uh well simon sinek who i'm sure most of uh the listeners are familiar with you know he talks about people buy don't buy what you do they buy why you do it and it's also that yeah people buy people um you know, when I choose, um, you know, I'm thinking about um, someone that I might need to hire, say an accountant. What's really important to me is that I'm going to get on with that person. I'm going to enjoy working with them and I'm going to trust them. And when I go to their website and look, you know, I might have had a referral or, you know, word of mouth. Uh, I've heard about this accountant. Um, I then go to their website. Account, uh, maybe an accountant is a bad example because they probably don't have very exciting websites. But you know, I want to feel I can trust them because that trust 
is really important. And that's what the words on your website can do if you're an architect. Yes, the images are fantastic. You need beautiful images. They can show what you can do, but it's the words that are going to build that trust and show that this is someone that I, as the potential client, want to work with. Um, you know, they're speaking my language. That's Those are the questions that subconsciously are going to be in there, in that potential client's head when they come mm. to your website. And, um, and, and and just just to kind of reinforce it, if I were listening to this podcast today, if you were if you're listening to this podcast today, have a look at your website and see whether you honestly think the words on your front page are aimed at your peers and the built industry, or whether they're aimed at your clients. And and I do I have seen a change. And to be fair, people like Juliet have really kind of upended a lot of the words with the, with her clients. She's helped her clients unlock what looks so much more authentic and so much more aimed at the potential, whether it's a commercial or residential client. But I think it's very easy for architects to hide behind their expertise. It's a confidence thing as well. Mm. But actually, who's your, what's your communication aimed at? It's not aimed at your peers. Of course you want your peers to love your buildings because that's just about being accepted. But actually it should be about who your target audience is and that isn't, that isn't, uh, the architect that you've known for 10 years. How, so, how, so how do we start to ring the emotional bells, if you like, of prospective clients? What sorts of words should we be using? What sorts so of... It's really about authenticity. Coffee? Yeah, it's about being oneself. So, um, I mean, Sue, this might be a good time to actually jump to our third example of a client we've worked with. I know that's going slightly out of the order we talked mm. about, but... Um, so um, we've worked, we've both worked with, with um, Sam Tisdall, um, who is a sole practitioner. Mm. And uh, as, you know, I'm going to now talk about all kind of sole practitioners, be confident about being you. Don't try to hide between this, uh, behind this idea of a bigger company. Um, if you do that, you, you know, you're going to be stumbling at every step because you're not being authentic. Um, so it's about just being very confident about being you and finding your own voice. And, you know, uh, uh, the right clients for you are likely to love that, um, that aspect because, yes, they don't, if they're choosing to work with you, um, it's probably because they like the idea of having one person who's going to be there for them the whole way through. So coming back to Sam Tisdall, you know, he's a sole practitioner that's uh so the work that i did with him which was after sue had worked with him um sue referred him on or sort of uh, brought him to me after she'd done her work with him he was by that time very clear about what he wanted to do but he hadn't found his voice he hadn't worked out that he could be authentic by talking about himself and he's actually at the point of being uh he's soon going to be launching his new website where he's kind of yeah let he's let the words out and he's feeling much more confident about how about his own story he's you know he's got his story straight and that's allowed him to then find his voice interesting that some of the i think the thing that's fascinating about when one of us might get a call or a, a kind of gets in touch wanting help often there's a we kind of think we need help but we know quite know what that help is um, and then there's a, okay, now I know I need help. I don't know how to go about doing it, which of course why they might need some, might need some external support. The interesting thing with Sam is that he was super clear about wanting to remain a sole practitioner because right. that gave him freedom and fitted with his lifestyle and he enjoyed not having the stresses and strains of managing a team, etc. cetera. Um, but he was at that point. I guess one of the questions is why do you need to set, create your story in the first place? What's the trigger for it? Often the trigger is some need for change. So if somebody comes and says, I, we kind of think we need some help, but we're not quite sure why, but there isn't a kind of almost crisis of opportunity happening, then often it doesn't get momentum. But in Sam's case, he wasn't at a crisis point, but he was at a point where he's thinking, I'm halfway through my, nominally halfway through my career. Yeah. It, it's been good to date, but I want it to be better yeah. in the next 10, 15 years. And I kind of think I need a little bit of a relaunch, but he wasn't quite sure how to go about it. So in that case, it started with, so what do you re what's really important to you? And actually, I, was, I kind of picked up on exactly the same point of Juliet that this confidence to be him, you know, he's got, it, was, it is his name above the door and he wasn't planning to change it. People need to buy into him. And he's a really lovely, engaging guy with hugely capable, but with his whole you know, 
network of experts, other consultants, complementary consultants, that he could engage to run projects. Um, and so it was about making sure that his strategy, his goals, properly articulated. My job was to kind of make sure those goals absolutely resonate with him and what's important to him. But at the start of it, he just knew something needed to be different. And so having got some of those very clear goals out, it was then how does he articulate that externally? Because he now needs to kind of relaunch himself. And that's when I said to Juliet, I think you could be, I said to, suggested to Sam that Juliet would be a great help in helping him frame those words so he could then start to make it come to life, if you like. And give him that confidence to have a really good next stage of his career, of the of the practice. Um, because it is that, you know, once you've got that clarity, you've got that, it gives you that confidence and it gives you a sort of consistency of kind of how you're talking about yourself. And, you know, what I do, it's really not just about the writing. It's so much about talking. It's about how we talk about what we do. Right. And, you know, with writing, it should be much more like how you speak. So if you can get it, if you can work out how to talk about yourself, you can then work out how to write about yourself. Um, it was interesting you were you were saying there about um, kind of being authentic and not falling into the pitfall of like if you're a sole practitioner you want to pretend that you're a large practice that's something that you know you've seen been guilty of myself you know you, you put the you put the royal we rather than I yes. you know that 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 sort of that sort of thing um, but in terms of if you're wanting to grow the business or you know if there are clients that are wanting to work with a larger outfit and you know i've seen small practices who can who are more than capable of delivering very large schemes and with a, with a but but will often do things to try and you know adjust that appearance if you like externally um is there a real commercial pressure there to to try and you know look bigger than you are does it ever work or is it or is it, are you treading a, a, a fine line here? I think you're treading a fine line. I mean, so it'd be interesting to know what you think of that. But I think, in fact, what you said, Sue, about, uh, you know, with Sam, it was about kind of um, showing that he had the he had the contact. He was part of a network and that when you buy into him, you're buying into the into that into that network. I, um, I think it's the clout. I, I think, you know, you hear this expression, fake it to make it. I'm, I'm not I'm not a great believer in that because then you're misrepresenting who you are, of course, mm -hmm. and that's dishonest. But in, if we go back to the Carl Turner scenario, he back back then, four or five years ago, it was about his, his kind of short-term goal was to win one major arts and culture project. Um, and that was going to be a pivotal point for him to move his practice in a different direction. Uh, and, and of course, that wasn't easy. And there's no magic wand to winning that piece of work that you've never won before in a new sector or of a different scale. You yeah. just have to, you got, you, that gets down to kind of the graft of running the business and putting this necessary time aside for growth making activity, which often doesn't happen. The day to day delivery of projects gets in the way. So that's back to a mindset issue, actually. So first of all, what's the goal? The goal for him was to win a, 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 a good arts and culture project. Then you've got to turn that into reality. And that's how much time was he going to spend going out, building his network, finding ways to win that piece of work. And, and he got a bit lucky because somebody took a punt on him. He, he, he got the Mount View Academy project, which has been an absolute game changer. It, it, was the, it was a game changing project for Carl in his career and his practice mm. and moved him to a different scale, which then sets him up to the next stage of growth. So for me, it's not about saying on your website, we do arts and culture projects when you've never done them before. It's about describing what you do that maybe isn't about sector specific, but the kind of approach or philosophy or whatever that at least kind of articulates the reason why you should be given that opportunity. But then beyond any strategy, you've got to get on and take act. This is yeah. getting on with doing the running of the business and the running of the business isn't just about hiding behind the delivery of projects. It's about setting real time against carefully thought through actions and getting on with driving growth. And often it's such so much of a sideline activity for a practice owner. So that's about a bit about belief, but it's about commitment as well. Yeah. So Brilliant. to use an example that, um, uh, that comes from my publishing days, you know, for a writer, it wasn't about sitting down to write a masterpiece. It was about sitting down to write 500 words. And, you know, it's the same with any job. It's like, 
yes, you've got to have those that vision, but you've also got to get on and do it and sit down and make it happen. And uh, so it's about both. So that's why, you know, it's the vision, the goals, and that sitting down every day and just doing it. And one of the barriers to that is if you're a sole practitioner, you've only got yourself to account for, so it's very easy to make excuses for yourself. If you're in joint ownership with somebody, you've got somebody internally who can hold you to account. But sometimes, you know, in that kind of strategy development and then implementation, there is still some need for external support to come in and both hold the owner to account, say, right, how are you getting on with your plan? And there's the kind of date in the diary. It's not about fear, but it's about it's about knowing that there's a point where the owner's going to have to say, have I done what I said I was going to do? Yeah. And sometimes it might be about saying, okay, you haven't managed to get there. What's got, what's got in the way? You know, how can you kind of reset in order to get the momentum back? Because inevitably that happens because, you know, crises happen on site or a contractor needs yeah. replacing or whatever. And so momentum is lost. It's getting that momentum back and knowing that you're going to have some bumps along the road. Well, you made a very good point there about, you know, it's, it's consistent growth activities. And, and, you know, once you've got a target, you've a goal, it's clearly defined, it's locked in. Now it's about consistently putting in the graft and not, you know, as you say, not hiding behind just doing delivery activities or the things that we're comfortable doing. And often growth making activities are, they're either unknown to what an arc, you know, for, for the architect, or there's a massive discomfort because ultimately there's some form of rejection that might be involved. Yeah. Um, so this, uh, um, this might be good be a good moment to talk about our third sort of case study that yeah, I, uh, who's a shared client which is design story a um a practice based in cheltenham um by um a couple life partners as well as business partners and um they had approached me first to help with the with communicating their message communicating what they were about but i quickly realized that actually they needed more than that they needed more than i could bring and it was about yeah, working out those goals that and that business plan beneath the words they needed, what I would do with them needed underpinning by something, um, something stronger in a way, something that was a, uh, really worked out where they were going with the business. And so I, well, I had a few first conversations with them and then very quickly I realised that, that Sue needed to come on board and then we worked with them in tandem or in parallel um, and you know, that was a really good process, I think, for both of us, wasn't it, Sue? Yeah, and it, it was kind of a mute, all three of us realised, all three parties realised realize that, you know, one plus one plus one was going to be more than three. Um, and and we iterated that. So if you like, uh, Juliet started helping them with their words and their story. And then I came in and was pressure testing it from a business and commercial point of view and saying... Right. It, what does that really mean? How are you gonna? How what does that? How does that translate into some meaningful, specific goals that you're going to aim at? And it, typically, there is a kind of there's always a rough idea about what those goals are, but they're never they're never specific enough, and they're never something to aim for. And interestingly, initially, the, the original plan with Design Story was that I was going to help them with a full blown business plan, but you know these things, circumstances change, and something comes along. So in reality, where we are at the moment is still a live process. If we've got as far as story, uh, mission, vision, goals, and some specifics, but actually, I then come and help them on something operational, which is about their fee proposal, because actually for them to grow, they realised they weren't quite articulating their value in the right way that was helping them really win those pieces of work, and growth was a fun is and remains a fundamental part of their strategy. So their priority this year was to grow, both grow in terms of, projects but actually build the team behind that so actually there's a need to divert away sometimes from the original intent in how we work with clients to say right. hang on a minute if we do this now this will really help you accelerate some momentum and be fluid about the the, the support that's provided um, we, we've spoken a, a bit about here about goals about narrative um and being able to articulate that where do company values come into all of this as part of a vision framework and and why are they important? Or what are they? Or how would you how would you describe what they are? For me, the values describe the behaviours and what the what a practice or business should feel like. It's it's an it's a set of we all know what values mean at a sort of gener, general level, but mm. at a, at a company level, for me, they become a meaningful set of 
statements, not for the sake of it, but that allow you to say, if we behave like this and operate like this, either in either internally with ourselves, but also with our clients and collaborators, then we're being true to ourselves. And these are really important because they are, they are about standards, but they're about beliefs. So for me, that's what a set of values are about and why they're important. Well, it's a bit like the business plan. If you don't have an intent about where you're heading, then you'll end up somewhere by accident. From a culture point of view, values are a way of defining the culture of a business. And they can be fundamentally important about your purpose. So I, you know, different clients, it's kind of more on, it's higher or it's further away or closer on their radar, but they're still kind of there as a how we want to run the business. And somehow you, if you can articulate some values based element within your story, then you're back to being more authentic and being true to yourself. And being so, able to communicate it to your team. So, you know, with a whatever size practice you are, if you're more than one, then everyone's got to be on board. Otherwise, you're always going to be dragging people along. Um, so being able to articulate those values means you can share those values. Yeah. And I've worked with a client where I helped him co-create the values with his team on the basis, of course, if you've got the team engaged behind them, then everybody's buying into what's important to them as individuals as well as collectively. But interestingly, now that those are there, he uses those in order to kind of stretch the thinking of the team on how they should deliver great projects and how they should engage with clients and how they should behave internally. So, yes, he can use it for appraisal purposes, if you like, for having a discussion with an individual about whether they could be better and more effective or even more positive about work. But actually it becomes, you know, you know, we are responsible. What does that mean? Why did, why did we do that on this project? So you can use it as a kind of way to continue to elevate performance and a sense of being, if you like, and connection within, within a business. How does, it, how does a business then uncover these values? What, what sort of process do they need to go through to kind of find them? If you like, are they, they, they something quite example? personal or, or? Yeah, Julia, why don't you give um, an example? Okay, so I've I've got several different ways of sort of getting there. One of the things that can be very useful is the the Japanese system of um, I think you pronounce it ikigai, where um, you're getting people to think about what they're good at, um, what um, uh, what they're good at, what they like doing, um, what the world needs, and what they can be paid for. And that's, a, you know, you get to that central point, which fits all of those things. And I think that what they can be paid for is really important because there's no point, you know, if you're in, if you're going to make a living, there is no point kind of going off uh, uh, and thinking about, thing, you know, being, um, yeah, thinking about something that you love doing, um, but actually it should only be a hobby. Yeah. You know, this has got to be something that people want. And, you know, at some point with that story that you're starting to craft, you're going to have to flip it out to your ideal clients and it's got to work for them. Um, so that, you know, what you can be paid for, very important. But yes, those other things about what you're good at, um, uh, what you're good at, what you love doing, and what the world needs, and you know that what the world needs, I think, is lovely too. Because I think, well, in the built environment, you know, most of us, and you know, I'll put myself into the built environment because I work with architects. Um, we're about making the world a better place. You know, I think mo I'm hoping that ninety let's say 95% of architects or maybe even 99% have got that somewhere in them that, you know, buildings really can make a difference to how we all live and can make us feel better. Um, so, you know, that, that will feed into your values. Mm. But um, I think, I think it's interesting because I, I think in a way the value starts a little bit like the way I'd have a conversation about vision, which is what's important to you and your team first and then how do you make sure, of course, it's highly relevant and translated appropriately externally? So it is deeply personal. And for me, there are things like, you know, how we treat each other, uh, standards of behavior. So, of course, what the world needs is part of that. We all kind of deserve respect and should be treated with respect and treat each other as we would ourselves, all that kind of stuff. But it kind of has to start with your your own belief sets. And the whole point, the, the benefit of doing it as a team level rather than just an owner level is you you create that sense of belonging and, per, and common purpose. Even if the vision isn't there, you create a common purpose about how we're going to do things around here. 
mm-hmm. uh, and, it, and it's very powerful. And of course, one of the things that's really important about a vision and strategy is that not only is it something that can somehow translate to how you're working with your clients, but it's fundamental to team buy-in and team performance. You know, I talk about high-performing teams. Having vision and values for me is right at the top of that. Yeah. If you haven't got a team that's engaged behind some common purpose with a set of behaviours and standards of how we do things, then the chances are the team are going to kind of do their own thing or they're going to kind of do their own thing without you and leave. And, and attracting the right team as well. Mm, exactly, exactly. Yeah, exactly. and um, yeah, I think um, since you mentioned that, Ryan, I think um, all those ads that we just say, see about we are hiring, we are a, an award-winning multidisciplinary practice, with a, talk about the person you want to hire, to make them, you know, make it resonate with them about what they want they can bring to the practice. It's like another thing where you need to flip it out from you and chime with the person that is going to be your ideal person. That's how you're going to start to attract the right people to your practice. And, you know, all that communication that you do as a, as a practice is, it, it is first and foremost for your ideal clients. You know, they are the people who are firmly in your head, but it's also going, you want it to resonate with, with the staff you want to attract. And that's what's going to, you know, mean that you're a team of like-minded well you know diversity you know you want different kind of people to come and be part of your practice but you still want to share those values at the end of the day communication for me is speaking is equal to hearing Mm. now if you're not speaking to somebody who wants to listen then you're missing your point so actually if you are aiming it at the person who you want to listen to you and properly hear what you have to say you need to speak their language and often that the speaking part isn't aimed at the person who's receiving those words right. and that and it's flipping it on its head yeah. in how you and and that's the kind of that's the skill in developing a vision or a values or a set of strategies. It's kind of, it resonates and properly lands as a message yeah. to yourself, of course, but to the people that you're communicating it to. Yeah, it's also the skill in, in writing because when you start to write something, there are two questions you should have in your head. One is, who's it for? And what's it for? And if you can answer those and have those answers clearly in your head, then you 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 have a really good starting point for writing something that's going to resonate with the people mm. who do it for and get them to do what you want them to do. So, you know, if it's about showing why they can trust you, then know that that's the point of what you're writing and it will have that effect. This is, this is painting a very dynamic picture of a vision framework and company values. You know, there's, there's often uh, the kind of cliched image of corporate values which get printed into a book and then you know maybe they're printed out and stuck on the wall but they don't they're not lived they're not real and actually you know if we're going to spend the time investing in in developing company values they've got to be breathed into life they've got to be communicated and led and instilled into the actual actions and behaviors and like you're saying here the hearts if you like of of the people that are actually um, going to experience them and done in a natural way. So, you know, it's not about saying, you know, the, the owner saying once a week, I'm going to refer to the company values, the practice values in a Monday, Monday morning team meeting. Yeah. That's, that's false and, and, and isn't going to engage anyone. It's about making them part of the everyday language and conversation. It's and about... And ready to tweak them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, it's, you know, it's, uh, the, the, the analogy I draw, I was just doing some uh, training with a couple of engineers, senior engineers in a practice recently, and I was talking about how you give constructive feedback, which is something a lot of people find quite difficult to do. And what I gave them was a little framework that helped them structure how they could deliver a compelling but constructive message about an issue with one of their team. And they said, but, you know, it sounds really stilted. You know, if I, should I follow it to the letter? And I said, of course not. If you do that, you're going to sound like you're a robot. But use that framework as a, as a way to build the confidence to start having those conversations and just start using it. And for me, that's the same with values, really. You've probably got a set of words and you're not going to start referring to them verbatim because that isn't going to work. But if you kind of just start to drop the odd word or similar kind of perspective into a conversation naturally about 
you know, maybe some quality issue to do with the project. You know, say, you know, how does that how does that come back to what we set out as a kind of really important part of how we do things around here? Mm. And ask those kind of questions of the team. Then you start to make it part of the conversation. It's not about top down imposing it in every conversation. That that will never work. But you've got to start at the start. It will it will sound a bit stilted. But it's about making it a habit, and you have to kind of break through that initial slightly awkward uh, phase in order to make it more kind of everyday. This is really interesting. Is, is yeah, how how values become alive in a business. Um, have you got some examples here of, of how your clients have done? I love this idea of you know actually you're asking questions which are framed around values and and using that in natural conversation. Um, are there any other strategies or tactics that you can think of that help? bring values to life inside of a business once they've been clearly articulated? Uh, well, for me, it's very much about um, keeping the website content. So uh, if I uh, go back a stage, um, when you write your website content, um, it could be that you think, oh, done it, tick that one off, done my practice profile, and you never look at it again mm -hmm. until about, well, six months later and you're slightly cringy uh, about it because you realise you've moved on since then. So I think it's about um, keeping that content alive, being owning that story. And that's why, you know, I started when I first started Archetypal, I was doing a lot of writing for my clients and I quickly realised that actually they need to own that story. They need to be comp feel confident about doing the writing and owning uh, and kind of wielding the pen and mm. yes I can be there as an editor and sounding board and fresh pair of eyes but they've got to be confident to do it so that that website content and you know the website generally just like the practice is living breathing evolving on a day-to-day -day level you know it can never just stay still because it's got to be it's got to be part of the practice it's not just some shop window that you allow to get dusty you know, you've got to interact with it. If I can give a slightly more difficult example, because that's a kind of positive reason for doing it, an example would be with a client um, I've been working with for quite a few years now, and he had co-created company values with his team. I was part of that with them. And one of his senior architects was basically a good architect but not engaging properly. Mm -hmm. And actually, in that case, he was struggling a bit with how to do that because said actually the performance of this architect isn't isn't an issue but the fact is he's kind of not stepping up in the way I'd expect him to hit at this level you know how do I deal with that and I and I said bring it back to a conversation about behavior and values as opposed to hardwired measurable performance like is it the project on time on budget and say this is what I expect of you and my observation is that you know that you're not you're not in this place you know what's what's behind that you know what can I do to help yeah is there anything I'm doing that is maybe getting in the way you know it's kind of putting a little bit on yourself to make that engage it's about engagement and rapport of course and trying to get the individual to really explain what was going on and, and you know that the, the, the real the reality of was it was it was he actually felt like the sort of practice that he was in wasn't the right sort of direction he wanted to take and was fundamentally questioning whether he wanted to c continue his career in architecture. And in that case, had that using a kind of, you know, you don't, you're not, it doesn't feel like you're as engaged as you used to be. You don't need, you know, you don't have to make it, you're not, you're not, you're really disengaged at the moment. What the hell's going on? It can be a yeah. really nurturing conversation to say, it's really important to me that you feel as engaged as the rest of the team because that's one of our values. Yeah. So what's going on? And actually having a series of, in reality, performance-based discussions on a regular basis, so quite a structured process, in order to get to a point where in the end there was a conclusion. It wasn't actually the conclusion the owner hoped for, but actually it's probably the right conclusion. Brilliant. Brilliant. That's a very that's a very powerful illustration of of actually how the a team can can be shaped, if you like, and also, you know, it it it's kind of keeping everybody on the same ship, if you like. Yeah, and making it real and genuine and personal and conversational. Yeah, and and giving everyone the, the kind of freedom and a guideline to see whether this is a fit or not. Yeah, and ultimately, that's not always comfortable. It's not always you know, change is always upsetting. You know, once the once the values can be used like that, then I can say it's very very powerful. Um, 
Brilliant. I, is there anything else like in, in terms of like defining a company's purpose or this, this idea of a mission or a mission statement that are important in, in the vision framework, if you like? Um, well, I, I always like the idea. Uh, well, I've had this with clients where they suddenly say, oh, we love that line, you know, that they, I've, they've come up with with my help of, that kind of encapsulates something about who they are. And they say, oh, they're going to put it on the wall. And um, I, th- I always think that's a lovely idea. And I think, you know, you should be proud of of your values, of your of your purpose, mm-hmm. uh, you know, um, speak loudly and clearly about it. And that's an incredibly attractive thing for for the whole team, um, but also for potential clients to have, you know, to have that pride in why you're doing something. And, you know, people coming into work every day um, and seeing it on the wall. And, you know, if it's, if you, if you veer off course, you'll know it because suddenly you're seeing that, those words and they're not chiming and they're not resonating anymore with what you're doing. Um, There's something, it's, it's strange, isn't it? Because I also think why the why and the purpose sounds like such an abstract concept, doesn't it? It's like, how on earth, how on earth do I kind of get that out? But when you do land some words that somehow encapsulate in a simple way, you know, it's not about a great big paragraph, but like a simple line. It's it's incredibly emotional, and and if you can, if the if you if the owners can do that themselves, or can get some help from somebody like Juliet to kind of articulate that, and and then all of a sudden it kind of that in itself starts to drive momentum and energy. But if they're meaningless words then they, they serve no purpose. The mm. purpose words serve no purpose. Yeah, yeah. So, and it's teasing that out, and it's not easy. And sometimes they can land quite quickly. I was doing, I mean, I'm not in any way, I'm not an expert at words like Julia. I would never co- confess to be that. But sometimes by having a conversation, you can just suggest something or somebody else comes up with a word and think, that's it, nailed it. And you know when you've nailed it because it is emotional and it kind of, you know, you can get you can actually get goosebumps if you get the right words. It's yeah. that kind of physiological reaction as well. And I can guarantee that the word unique won't be in there. <laughs> the word multidisciplinary will not be in there. And the word award winning is highly unlikely to be in there. So, you know, you've got to stay away from those. Any So I see jargon as a kind of shortcut that, mm. yes, it's useful when you're talking to your colleagues because you don't want to have to explain the whole thing. So, yes, that we've devised words that pack it all in. But when you're talking, you know, when it's outward facing words, client facing words, you've got to unpack those because a jargon, it's a shortcut, but you're missing the scenic route. You're not taking us anywhere. You're not taking us on a journey. So you need words that do take us on a journey, that do have that emotional punch and that uh, that you and you can get to those by, you know, if you uh, let's think about the words um, or the experience. Uh, adjective multidisciplinary Um, unpack that and what does it actually mean so ask yourself so what and what it means is that oh we have different experts who who come together and will you know untangle the problem by coming at it from different places and wow doesn't that sound great doesn't that sound like the kind of team I want on board but a multidisciplinary team I'm not that interested so what? Yes, yeah, like everybody else. So what? Yeah. But but I think the other thing is just to make sure you can get your why and your purpose defined, and it may not even be perfect, but it may be something to get started with. Whether you need to kind of polish it and use it externally, or just use it whatever. Have but but without but without without you kind of still need to get on and kind of get below that. Otherwise, mm. it kind of sits loosely there as an aim without anything to kind of get you there. Got it. So it needs it needs structure underneath. It needs something below it, and and I think that's why that's why Juliet and I have realised how we're kind of perfect collaborators and friends, by the way, that <laughs> we kind of we kind of approach we kind of have the same philosophy and buy in or energy and passion about why these things are important, but actually we both come at it from this you know how is it going to help the business? Mm. Where does it fit with the? wider aims of the business and it's kind of making sure that you know we bring our own unique perspectives and experience to it in order to kind of shape that is is there a specific example that you can think of and where 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 the company has kind of come up with a, a short simple purpose statement if you like or a reason for the existence of the organization which is which 
which kind of uses emotive language or can kind of, you know, the, the words they've used that they've, is there anything that springs to mind? You know, I, well, I've got an example that I can't talk about concretely, annoyingly, because I know examples are supposed to be concrete, but I'm working with a client at the moment where um, we've had um, three workshops um, and we've come up with a, um, a brilliant line that, that really um, takes you far further than anything that they'd ever said on their website before. Mm. So we haven't, it's not for public consumption yet, annoyingly. Um, but, you know, I I think we all, we, uh, the last, the workshops were around the table because this is just like over the last month or so. Yeah. Um, so we were in person. And when, we, when that learning came up, it's like all of us around the table suddenly went, yes. And it's, we all could see that there was a power in it and that it mm. really sort of nailed what that practice was about. Um, so as Sue said, you know, it's a really good feeling when you, when you find those words. And, and, and I suppose it's, it's a bit strange to look at the words in isolation and without context, because those words in the context of a, of a business and organization or the, a, a simplified statement is often a, a process that's got people, got people there to think about it. And it kind of triggers yeah, but they but they should make you want to find out more. Right. So if they sit there without any kind of so what, back to Juliet's point, mm -hmm. then then actually it hasn't worked. So there ha it kind of needs to tease the reader or whoever's listening to that to kind of say, oh, tell me more. So I was just taking it away from architecture. I was just looking at Tesla's mission statement. Yeah. So there's a mission vision statement. And the Tesla mission statement is to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable transport. Now, is that really emotive? I don't know. It probably depends how you feel about the environment. Mm. But it's pretty clear that they want to play a big role at a global level yeah. in a particular sector. It's really clear. And actually, you know... Look, let's face it, most of us are passionate about the need for change in this space. So that's kind of, for me, that's a pretty compelling mission statement. And it's short. You kind of feel like there's something, some, some higher purpose behind that statement. Yep. Um, yeah. And you kind of already start to feel some kind of kinship with a company when it has something that resonates with you, which means you want to find out more again. Yeah. To, to start wrapping up this conversation, um, is there a difference then between, say, design values and business values? And, and, and should a practice have, you know, you know, one set of core values that summarizes everything? Because it's often architects are very good at um, writing a manifesto, if you like, but it will tend to be more about how we design rather than anything to do with a business or how we how we're going to do business or should the two be interlocked one and I'm the not, same i guess i guess it depends whether you think a design value is of true value or whether it's more of a principle of how we do stuff and a pro it's explaining the process or something. yeah so for me that's less about a philosophy or belief it's much more about a process to juliet's point so i don't know if you can give an example because i'm not sure i quite understand your point Ryan, have well, you got for, for example, RSHP is a good example where a lot of their principles are things like legibility and economy uh, or, or public space. And now these things have a kind of crossover, if you like. They, mm -hmm. they, they're a very distinct design philosophy, but they're all and they're architectural principles, but they're also business principles. Or they can be applied to, yeah, to, business, I see. to, to business as well. And I, I find sometimes when I'm when talking to architects that sometimes the design philosophy or principles, they can make very good business principles. Yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, this the kind of the way of thinking about architecture or, or buildings is something interesting that could, that can invite other people in. And uh, also okay. be a I, way of... yeah, I, now I understand. And I, and I, I think they, they absolutely can be woven into the company values. Mm. So if I think about another client I've worked with, they've talked about innovation as being one of their yes. cultural principles. Well, that can apply in so many ways, can't it? It can apply to how you do the work, the process of delivering space, designing space and buildings. But it can also, it's an attitude as well, being innovative, isn't it? It's deciding we're going to challenge the status quo. So absolutely. But I think you just have to be careful when you think about 
these words that you're developing what's what are we trying to achieve with these words it's back to the what's the end in mind here yeah is this is this about making sure we have a process that's super clear design wise or is it more of a philosophy and a statement of a state of mind in which case how can we make this kind of resonate at a kind of standards level belief level but also communicate the quality of the work that we do or our approach to work and in that case it's absolutely wound up in values and answer to your question they should be put together is would be my recommendation rather than sitting as two separate sets of statements or words fantastic and just to add something to that uh, i had one client who i worked with um and it was all about kind of how to tell their story and afterwards uh, the director said to me um oh th this is not just a great blueprint for writing it's a great blueprint for design as in the way that i help them tell their story would then inform the way they would think about their projects which is great because if you're telling a great story about your clients that is going to make you a better designer in a way because you're going to kind of be um tapping into you know into who they are why they you know what pro what they're worried about what are their problems what you're trying to achieve for them um so it's about yeah if you can talk about what you do if you can if you've got those values clear and it can tell a good story you you will be a better designer you know you'll be better at communicating what mm -hmm. you do yes but you will also be better at what you do and you know i think thinking writing and doing they all go hand in hand they're all part of the same thing brilliant it's a it's a it's a prosperous circle if you like yes indeed fantastic well uh, sue juliet thank you so much for that incredibly insightful and detailed look at what's what goes into a, a company's vision the business plan um and the, the importance of having strong narrative and and language and how that kind of underpins a business's culture and its and its growth it's been really really uh wonderful to d discuss that and and hear your insights and expertise so thank you very much thanks ryan it's been fun thank you thank you and that's a wrap and don't forget if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom fulfillment and profit please visit smartpracticemethod.com or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly follow the link in the information the views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.